Hi and welcome to a very special youth edition of the Leader Onomics Show. We have with us today Captain Kahorma James Anthony Tan. He's a 23-year-old who holds the Guinness World Record for being the youngest person to fly around the world solo. He's let nothing hold him back despite being diagnosed with dyslexia at age 8. He set the world record at age 21 and in 2013 the World Record Academy named him Man of the Year. Join us as we get to know more about Captain James Tan. And welcome to the Leader Onomics Show. In today's episode, we have with us Captain Kohorma James Anthony Tan, who holds the world record for being the youngest pilot to fly around the world. Uh, thank you for being with us, James. Hi, hi everyone, and <laughs> thank you for having me. So no very problems. Much. Thanks, thanks for being with us. Now, I want to know what started you off on your love for flying. Oh, okay. Uh, well, this is. Uh like every boy's dream actually. Well, I was thinking about six or seven. I can't really remember nowadays. Uh, I was, um, my mom was uh, actually t taking me towards the UK for, for holiday. And uh, I saw the 747 for the first time in my life. You know, I saw the hump, you know, she looked so pretty. I was like, woo. And then after that, I- So the planes are she? Yes, of course. All, all, all planes are girls. <laughs> all planes are girls, trust me. Okay. Trust me on this. Because, because they have mood swings, they have this, they have that, but anyways. Or so not, we'll not just say that, go on, go on. <laughs> then, 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 then after that, I, I saw the captain mm. with his four bars, with his hat, and I was like, you know what, that looks really cool. But the thing that changed my interest into passion was in flight itself. I saw a red fighter fly, 40 de uh, sorry, fly 90 degrees up in the air, and I was like, you know what, it's a sign, uh, I'm going to do this. And I did. You did, you just started at what age? Uh, I got my aviation PPL at the age of 18. And I became a fully uh, qualified uh, pilot uh, with a citation rating at 20. 20, and then 21, you set the world record. That's correct. That was last year. Yes, And that's then right. you're now 22. No, I just turned 23, actually. You just turned 23. I know I'm old. I am so old. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you do? Do you fly full time or no, what do you do now? I fly part time now. Uh, I used to fly full time. I used to be a private jet pilot. I used to fly v VVIPs to all around Europe, around America, uh, some parts of Asia, and especially within the Middle East. Then. Um, after, this was last year. A uh, year before. Year before. Uh, then after that, um, I went into ferry. Uh, okay, because there's, there's a lot of different types of flying. Because most mm. people. When they, when they say I'm a pilot, they straight away think it's a big plane with air hostesses and like food and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, that was my case at first, but then, but then I was flying like one or two people. But after that, I, I started doing ferry flying. Ferry flying is where you take an aircraft from one country to, to the other and you leave it there. When you leave it there, someone else is owning it. So, so someone else will fly it over there. Right. So, so that was my job, to fly really bad condition aircraft through oceans and continents. But how do you get these opportunities? You just meet somebody on the street, hey, can I fly? Basically, yeah, that's about it, actually. Uh, but my no, where? Where okay, are you going? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> We're not meeting the same people. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, my first ferry flight. Um, I... Okay, I was... I was in my sister's house in Derby, laying down, watching a movie, and I got a phone call. And they told me, James, are you available to fly an SR-22? which is a Cirrus, which is a single-engine piston aircraft, four-seater, uh, maximum altitude eight, seven thousand 7,000 feet. You cannot clear mountains with that. <coughs> Are you available to fly this aircraft from Oxford to Bangkok and from Bangkok fly back to Oxford? Uh, and I was like, okay, yeah, sure, why not? The next day, went for the training. Four days later, I went off and I've never done a cross-continental flight before in a piston aircraft. No so training, what, no what, experience. What led them to call you though? Of anyone else they could call, why did they call you? I'm very hardworking and I, and I go the extra mile. And, and they, how did they hear about that? Um, I'm very charming. <laughs> so you just put your, your, the word out there that you know, this is what you love to do and so people then knowing you, the way you work, 
then promote you to them? I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering how, because this, is, this doesn't happen to everyone, right? I'm very lucky. Okay. okay. I'm very lucky. I'm, I'm, I'm truly blessed, uh, which I'm very thankful for. Um, how I... Uh, actually, I don't remember the guy that called me, but um, <coughs> never met him before. Mm. Never flew with him before. Never... Um, even the person... <laughs> the person that hired me to fly the Cirrus was... His name was Roy Tomlinson. Uh, so I was in... Um, North England, and I got a phone call. Then I rushed down to London the very same day, rented a hotel room, a motel actually, I shared with eight, eight other people. Then, uh, this is when I was 19, by the way. I, I, I just left Australia, uh, then I went to the UK, so, so, I, so I'm, I'm trying to backtrack here. Anyway, so I was in London. Uh, then after that, I waited five hours for Mr. Tomlinson to come. He was late, five hours. He came and he, and he looked looked and looked and he saw this one small little Asian boy sitting at this cafe and I was like, hi. He's like, are you James? Yes. I was like, he was just looking at me, he was stunned. And um, then I was, so I asked him, you, you do know, you, but very rudely, but I'm not allowed to say for a camera, of course, you're late five hours. Then he laughed. Then we started bonding and we, and we became friends. Then he hired me as his private pilot. I flew him um, Europe, the Middle East and Asia. Hmm. So I guess, you possess also uh, people skills. I think that's something that you, you exhibited from even a very young age. Now, I want to find oh, out more. That's not true, actually. No? No, I was okay. extremely antisocial. Right. I was extremely antisocial. When uh, did that change? Um, uh, whew, okay, I was extremely antisocial until the age of 16. What shifted? I don't know. Something just snapped. Something, something. Yeah, uh, I. I, 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 I I hated to wear fine clothes. I I never did my hair. I, I pers personal grooming was never in in the equation. Um, I didn't speak because for me I have a stammer, mm. so I was uh, lacking confidence within uh, that sector as well. So yeah, it's until the age of sixteen that something just that. Uh, that something happened. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask you. Puberty. Also, yeah, puberty. puberty yeah. Happened. <laughs> I wanted to ask you also, because at the age of eight, you were diagnosed with dyslexia. That's correct, ma'am. How has that affected, uh, has that affected anything? How have you managed that? Uh, well, at first, process? to be honest with you, I was extremely ashamed of it. Uh, very hidden from it. Uh, because especially the mindset in the 90s wasn't as well. It's only 10 years, but it, it has changed dramatically. But, uh... <laughs> no, no, not to um, And, um... Okay, I just, I just want to say something. For, I was going to make a school, and this mm. school was actually dedicated towards special education. It's called Stavista. Mm. We have four bungalows already. We are the whole road system, and the only reason why it didn't happen, okay, this really hurt me and my mother, because my mother was the one heading it, uh, was uh, the, because, because this is housing area. And the, and the six people that live there, which are all teachers, Said that, said that special kids should not belong in a, in a centralized area. They should be sent to the jungle in Doga. What? Yeah, that, that really hurt me. But, but it's slowly changing. Mm. Uh, but there's a lot of issues. Yeah. Wow. But you've, you've conquered all of that. And look, you're a world record holder now <laughs> uh, with so much behind you. Thank you. We're, we're going to have more with Captain James Tan right after this break. back to the Leader Automic Show, we have a very special youth edition. With me here today is Captain James Tan. We were just talking about you know, the experiences he's gone through in his life. I want to find out, James, um, more about uh, this flying around the globe adventure okay. that you went okay. on. Um, because there was an incident uh, I hear of where radio contact was off for about two and a half hours and yep. you were above a frozen ocean. Yep, just, just, just give me one minute. Yeah. Youth edition! Okay, <laughs> alright, now back to the frozen ocean issue. Um, I was flying from Japan into Siberia. Uh, 
well, you can call it Siberia, but it's more uh, Kamchatka. So en route, uh, I lost my number one radio and I lost my number one GPS as well. I'm not sure. Even till this, even till today, I don't know why. And you were on your own. Yeah. So you're on your own. Yeah. How many hours into the flight? Uh, about uh, two hours and a bit. Uh, and uh, and I was flying, 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 and I could not communicate with Russia uh, because my HF radio wasn't working as well. Standard HFs never work, even when I flew across the Pacific on my on my on, on my most current trip. The HF never worked. <laughs> anyway, so I was flying across um, the North Pacific, and um, yeah, I had no radio contact. What was going through your mind? Do cell phones work? No. Even my uh, well, there are, there are a few cell phones that do work at those uh, l l latitudes. But mm. even your GPS on your phone, mm. it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. The reason so, why is because the, because the s most of the s s satellites mm. that uh, that like uh, we use every single day, they are limited to about twenty three degrees lat and long. Sorry, uh, latitudes north and south. So on top okay. of that, it just doesn't work. You right. you can get up to about 55, 58, 60 degrees latitude, but after that it just stops. So how did you how did you get through this? You just it was two and a half hours. Yeah, it was two and a half hours. Then finally, I I I think it was a Delta or was it a Korean airline flight? I can't remember. So I was just listening on uh, on one one eight decimal three five and and uh, and one two three four five. These are frequencies. And finally, I I heard someone talking, and I was like, Hey boys, how are you? <laughs> then then I asked them to to actually send a message in to Russia for me to to tell them I'm coming in please do not shoot me down all right. yeah basically okay. I was it. yeah don't, don't don't shoot me now surely you had many other experiences as well like that could you share with them um, maybe a couple of, <coughs> of well, moments that you really you know hold near to your heart okay well I could tell you all the mistakes I've done sure. okay um, I, I I landed in tai, Taiwan and I this, sorry, I was I was starting to take off from from Taiwan, and uh, into Fukaku, Japan, and I was like, you know what? It's, it's, it's only a typhoon. It's fine, you know, it's fine. But then uh, once I got onto the runway, my 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 storm scope. I have never seen it any other time in my aviation career. It was all red. It was just lightning and thunder everywhere. So I was like, yeah, it's fine. This is what you call youthful ignorance. And I was like, yeah, it's okay. So I took off the worst flight in my life. You know, I was being thrown around, flying across, my whole wing just flipped there, flipped there, flipped there. Uh, lightning, rain. I was, I was genuinely scared, and I couldn't believe how how stupid I was. Uh, that was one of it. And then after that, it was um, flying across, of course, Siberia. Uh, then Kam Kamchatka. Then on top, uh, when I head to from Kamchatka into Andrea, which is near the north, uh, near the lower side of, of the North Pole, uh, I saw right in front of me uh, a volcanic, a vo volcanic er eruption that was really really scary. Wow! Uh, because because for me, I was using a turbo prop, mm -hmm. and a turbo prop, uh, if there is vo vo volcanic ash going into it, the engine stops. So luckily for me, I was able to climb to 23,000 feet. And luckily for me, again, there was an inversion layer. So right underneath me, you see a blue sky. Mm. And right underneath that, you see gray layer of ash right underneath my aircraft. It was beautiful. It was gorgeous. Uh, then after you can see, and, and, it was, and, and, I was, and I was the only living human for about five, five, five kilometers around me because all you can see was white ice. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Um, but what do you think are the key skills needed to be a good pilot? Because even in that situation, you had to quickly make a decision, right? Yeah. What are the key skills? Because people will be wondering, you know, what if I want to do that too? Mm -hmm. What are the key skills that you think a pilot needs? Okay, being a pilot or being an, an expert expeditionist expedition. No, I'm, I'm not sure if that's mm. a word actually. Anyway. Like if someone, okay, well, if someone were to do what you did, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what are the key skills that you think were involved in that decision to, you know, have to go up to twenty three thousand feet? Is it observation uh, one, skills? Uh, okay, um, I'll be honest with you. Number one, you have to be extremely humble. You must not be overly confident. Hmm. Okay, you must listen to your elders. 
Uh, I know they can be extremely annoying and they're very slow, but they ha they have lived a lot longer than you have, and and there are some and there are some things that can only be learned by experience. Um, and surely no. it's decision making as well, because you looked at the situation, yes, you assessed you it, and you said, be, "I've got to do something about it." Yeah, you have to be decisive. Mm. Uh, a moment hesitation can cause absolute failure. Mm. Uh, you you need to be somewhat confident, but you must always maintain humbleness. Right. Uh, and uh, you must have luck. And I'll and, and I'll tell you what what what, what luck is to me. Uh, luck is labor under correct knowledge. Mm. Uh, you must know what's going on around you, your environment. So, you, so science can give you a rough es estimation of, of what is actually going on, but you must trust your gut mm. and just follow your heart. So you finished up in Subang Airport. Yep, that's right. Left at, left at Subang, landed at Subang. What was going through your mind when you, when you arrived back? How long, how long were you away for? Uh, 40, 48 days. 48 days? Yeah, 48 days. So when you came back, you landed, you touched down, Back on Tana Air, you know, oh, Subang yeah. Airport. Yeah. What was going through your mind? Uh, my speech actually. I was your to, speech. Yeah, I was to think what, what, your what speech to, to media. Yeah, I was trying to think what I was going to say. Um, what was it? Uh, actually, the most emotional part of my trip. Mm. You know, this whole entire project, the flight around the world, took me one year, four months of my life. In total, uh, I created the finance side, the the the, the, the logistical planning. The execution, the the whole shebang, took one year, four months of my life, uh, and of course the life of my team. Uh, How big was your team? Eighty. Wow. Yeah. How do you assemble a team of eighty? Like I said, I'm very charming, and um, yeah, it was. But I did, but I didn't feel a thing. Even mm. the day when I got the prime minister's signature, I didn't feel a thing. The whole time I didn't feel a thing. The only time. The relief for us. The only time when I felt something. A crack uh, was when I crossed through the border from Thailand into Malaysia. I weeped like a little girl. Honestly, I was crying my eyes off. And I landed at Elo Star before heading to Subang because we were doing a, 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 a joint flight going in. Mm. And uh, yeah, I crossed to the border and I was just weeping. I couldn't speak, you know. Elostar was calling me, are you all right? Are you all right? Are you all right? I'm fine. I'm fine. No, I was like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm glad to be home. Yeah, yeah, that was the only time. Uh, that was the only time. Any, um, any aims to break any other world records? Uh, you 23. There's so many years ahead of you. No, nah, currently I'm uh, setting the foundations to for me, I feel fulfilled. Mm. You know, I've, I set out to do the impossible and I achieved it. And now I'm setting the foundations for, for family. Great. Maybe one last question. Uh, for you know, some of our viewers who may be wondering, uh, what if I want to be a pilot? Mm -hmm. um, what, what are some pieces of advice you can give to them? Okay. Um, being a normal pilot? or Because there's many different types of being mm. pilots. Okay, That's just a right. normal pilot. Okay, um, you must be ready to leave home, sacrifice everything that you know and love. Your family, your friends, your girlfriend, it's not fair on them because you'll be away for a very long time. For me, I was away from home for four years and I didn't see my family for four years. Uh, you, you must be ready to leave in a moment's notice. Uh, I got a phone call at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. I had a shower, left, left straight away, prepared the plane and, I, and then we took off. Mm. You'd be ready to get extremely low pay for quite a long time uh, and pay at the end of the day isn't greater so that's why I'm in property development. <laughs> um, and uh, you must sacrifice who you are to who you want to become. But honestly, the best years of my life was in aviation and I have no, no regrets, it's beautiful. And you're really going to keep it as a hobby, even as you pursue property development? It's a lot more fun when it's a hobby. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to have more with Captain James Stein right after this. In fact, we're going to play a round of Thinkonomics Yay! with him. Stay tuned. Top 10 reasons why talent sleep companies. Great. Captain. 
this one. <laughs> Top 10 ways to stand out at work. What a difficult customer. It's difficult when you just but join then again, the new company. Customers are always right. Very angry and frustrated your boss. That can be a bad idea. Welcome back to the Leaderonomics Show. We are here still with Captain James Tan and we're just about to play a round of Thinkonomics. Oh, that, that, that really hurt my feelings there still. Wow, okay. <laughs> okay, never mind, sorry. You're no, good. just in case, you know, they know after the break. We're still, we're still with you. It's a good thing. It's good news for them. They want to know more about you. Um, so this is one way we're going to find out more about you. Okay. Uh, how it works is I'm going to give you the dice. You're just going to roll it based on the category you get. We'll, we'll draw the card. Okay. Right? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, building the future. I'm going to pull the card out. I'll get you to then read the question out. Okay, and are you sure? And then answer it. Yeah. Or do you want me to read the question I out? I think better okay, that you, you, you read it out. Okay, sure. Yeah. I'm just gonna randomly draw one. All right, Captain. How would the world be if everyone could sense and read other people's thoughts? There's, there'll be absolutely no, uh, when you mean sense, do they feel their emotions? I suppose you could hear what's going on in each other's minds. Well, if you can hear what's going on on each other's mind, there's no point. There's no privacy. No, there's no <laughs> point towards that gift because if you cannot feel mm. the pain, the joy or, or the frustration or the enjoyment, there's no point to know what's, what's going on. Because the most important thing, especially when it comes to people skills, is the feeling. So I think that's a useless power. Uh, but in terms of if you can read everybody's mind, gambling will be extremely boring. <laughs> um, yeah. But For in sure. terms of changing the world, it will be useless. Hmm. It will be useless. That's very insightful. Okay. Do you want to throw okay. it another time? Let's see what the next question is. Relationship. Relationship. <laughs> If Tom and Jerry could speak, yep. would they hate each other less? If Tom and Jerry could speak, would they hate each other less? Uh, I agree, yes, they, they would. What would they say to one another? Would you, would you, would you like some cheese? Uh, yeah. <laughs> just look, let's okay. just figure out a way to work this out. Yeah, we can, we can share, share we the can fridge. Share it. The okay, house is big enough for no, the both of us. How, how about this? Okay, you can catch catch me in front of your master once a week. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll play dead. You uh, will get like extra biscuits. Then after that, I'll go into the site, take a few of the biscuits or something. I don't know. It's collaboration. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's collaboration yeah. new level. Giving. All right, giving. <coughs> Last one. I'm gonna pull this out. Let's see what this is. If my motives are wrong, mm -hmm. should I stop giving? Ooh. Yes. Elaborate. Um, for me, the only reason why I'm okay, I'm being extremely selfish here. Yeah? But the only reason why I give to charity, I do charity work. I do I do a lot a lot of charity work. I I, uh, I feed the homeless with uh, with uh, NRC 11, we give English classes, we, we do a lot of charity things. But the reason why I do it is because I feel happy when I do it. If your motives is you are giving because it's what everyone else is doing, there's no point. Because if you don't feel happy doing it, what's the point? Uh, I, I know this might find self, uh, this might sound extremely selfish, but the reason why I do it is because I feel good about it. And that's why I do it. So do it with a glad heart. Yeah, have fun with it. And it's so fun, you know, I, I met this one guy from Indonesia, it was so funny. Uh, I, uh, because like for me, I, 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 I like to make games out of everything. And, uh, and, and we were having a, a, having a competition. It was me and this girl serving coffee at about 11 o'clock at night on a Wednesday, mm -hmm. or the other group serving s s s s s syrup ice, mm -hmm. and we won. We gave more coffee out at 11 o'clock <laughs> in, in, in the evening. So who could syrup. give more out? Exactly. I was like, come on, guys, we got the best coffee for Arabic as well. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. So if your intentions is to do it because you have to, 
it's because it's because it's part of the part of the social like protocol. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your money. Do with a sincere and a glad yes. heart. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts Thank you. with us. Thank you. So we've been here with Captain James Tan on the Leader Automics Show. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to catch more of our videos on our YouTube page, Leader Automics Media. See you next time. Bye-bye.